Good evening. I'm Vani Vanapagari. Lynn Moffinson is unable to present this data. So thank you for the opportunity to present this data on behalf of the co-authors and the APR steering committee members. So I'm an employee of Weave Healthcare. I'm also the industry co-chair for the APR. And the APR is a collaborative project jointly funded by the manufacturers of antiretrovirals. So I don't have to go into any details. All of you have attended the presentations that Dr. Josh has had on the updated data from the CEPAMO birth surveillance study in Botswana. But outside of the CEPAMO data, we have had limited data. There have been some, but limited data um, on birth defect outcomes with periconception exposures. So we evaluated the prevalence of central nervous system defects, neural tube defects, and encephalocele in the antiretroviral pregnancy registry by ARV class and individual drugs. The encephalocele is considered separately from NTDs in the APR as it may occur slightly after the neural tube closure. These data are updated through January of 2019. So what started as the Zidovidin in Pregnancy Registry in 1989 is now the Antiretroviral Pregnancy Registry um, with over 26 sponsors and multiple drugs that we monitor birth defects for. So the registry has collected prospective voluntary anonymized reports of women on art during pregnancy, capturing prospective data. It provides an estimate of risk for major birth defects compared to general population to give an early warning of potential teratogenicity. Currently, we have 160 ARVs, 57 brand, and 103 generic drugs that are monitored through the registry. And it's an international registry, although most of the, about 75 to 80% of reports come from the US. So I want to briefly touch on the number of pregnancies we need to either confirm or refute the defect signals. So the ability to rule out an increase in birth defects with drug exposure is related to the defect prevalence in the general population and the number of observed exposures. So 200 first trimester exposures can rule out a two-fold increase in overall birth defects when the prevalence in the general population is 3%. However, for a rare event like NTDs with a prevalence of one over a thousand, to rule out a threefold increase, we would need about 2,000 periconceptional exposures. The periconception is the most relevant period of exposure um, for the NTDs, and that's why we, we want 2,000 preconception, preconception or periconception exposures. So now coming to the APR and the, uh, the categories of data that we collect, prospective uh, pregnancy reports are the primary data collection and the primary analysis um, data for APR. So that means pregnancies are reported with exposures before the pregnancy outcome is known. So, um, and the primary analysis is, includes prevalence, and prevalence estimate is the mainstay of effect estimate for the APR. Um, prevalence is calculated as number of defects over number of live births. And we have internal and external comparators. The external comparators being Metropolitan Atlanta Congenital Defect Program run by the CDC, and the Texas birth defect rates. They give us the population rates for the birth defects. And then the internal comparators are first trimester exposed pregnancies versus second and third trimester exposed and pregnancies exposed to one drug compared to all the other drugs. So these are the kind of multiple comparisons we do um, to calculate the prevalence and um, give the estimates. So then <clears throat> APR also receives retrospective cases and cases from uh, clinical studies. So we do a secondary review of all of those cases for clusters and patterns, but Again, remember that the primary analysis and the interim report that is made available to the public includes the prospectively reported cases. 
So clinicians register pregnant women um, prospectively, and um, they report data on exposure throughout pregnancy and provide birth outcome data. Birth defects are reviewed by a dysmorphologist, a geneticist, clinical geneticist, who is also a dysmorphologist. And we use modified MACDP criteria classified by organ system for birth defect classification. Um, modify, the APR criteria are more stringent than the MACDP criteria, and so our um, estimates are more conservative. And the analysis includes birth defects. Um, birth defect, to count it an event as a birth defect, it should be either one or more major birth defect or two or more minor birth defects. So I'm going to summarize data on the prospectively enrolled pregnancies, um, overall data, and then by ARV class and by specific drug. Also looking at the earliest trimester of exposure, um, the earliest trimester of exposure assigned to each drug in three ways. One is the periconception. That's ARV exposure from two weeks before conception through 28 days after conception, roughly six weeks of estimated gestational age. And then the later first trimester, initial exposure started later in the first trimester, um, and then second or third trimester exposures. So overall, we have 20,372 pregnancies with 2727 pregnancy outcomes. That means we have had some twins and triplets. So there are 10,952 first trimester exposed. The ARV exposure for the first time happened in the first trimester for these um, pregnancies. Of them, 78% have preconception exposures. Median maternal age at conception was 29 years, and you can see the CD4 spread with about 14% having um, less than 200 cells at the time they were reported to the APR. So this is a busy slide. Um, for drugs to be included for comparison with population rates, a drug must meet the threshold of having at least 200 first trimester exposures. That's the criteria we set for the APR. There are 21 ARVs that have 200 or more exposures. So this red line, that's the one that's the Metro Atlanta rate. And then this is the Texas birth defect rate. And if you look at this, the first trimester um, prevalence is 2.75%. That's the APR birth defect rate for first trimester exposures. And that sits very tightly um, uh, along the Metro Atlanta um, uh, rate. So there are two drugs that have increased rates compared to the Metro Atlanta rate, but less than the Texas birth defect rate. Uh, and those are nilfenivir and DDI. So now coming to the CNS and NTD cases. In the 20,727 pregnancy outcomes, um, including 19,287 live births, there were 536 birth defect cases, overall birth defect cases, for a prevalence rate of 2.8%. 51 are CNS defects, and they included eight NTDs and one encephalocele. Most of these reports came from the US or Canada, 75% of them. Um, of the 8,546 with preconception exposures, there were 241 birth defect cases with a prevalence of 2.8%, 23 CNS defects, including three NTDs. So now we'll, we'll just list out tabulating the CNS defects on the neural tube by class and by the individual drugs. You'll see that there are 23 CNS defects and the three neural tube defects. So this is a build, but I'm just going to do this. So if you see, look at this, those three neural tube defects, all three of them were exposed to an, an NRTI, one of the backbones. Um, one of them was exposed to API, one of them was exposed to an NRTI, and one to integrase inhibitor, and that's dolutegravir. And then here we list the three um, cases, the defect cases. One was an anencephaly, one myelomeningocele, and one meningocele. All three of them come from the United States. One was a stillbirth, and two were live births. 
For an encephaly case, um, the mother was of Hispanic ethnicity. Myelomeningocele had a recorded fetal alcohol syndrome. These confounding factors are not completely captured by the APR. That data is incomplete. So we wouldn't have all the confounding risk factors associated with um, neural tube defects. So in conclusion, the overall prevalence of NTDs in the 8,546 periconception ARV exposures was 0.03%. Most of the reports in the APR come from North America, where there is a national food um, folic acid fortification program, and the folic acid fortification has been shown to reduce NTD risk by 36 to 68 percent in the general population. So this frequency that we have seen as the overall um, prevalence is consistent with the observed low NTD prevalence in most developed countries that have the folic acid fortification programs. So in the updated APR data, that is data through the January of 2019, there's one NTD with 248 periconception dollar degree wear exposures, giving a prevalence of 0.4% for dollar degree wear and 0.14% for integrase inhibitors as a class. But this is based on only one NTD in a relatively small number of exposures. If I bring back that number we talked about earlier, it's we need at least 2,000 preconception exposures to either confirm or refute um, this as a um, signal. The number of pregnancies enrolled in the APR with integrase inhibitor class preconception exposures are currently insufficient to rule out or confirm any potential association with NTDs. And healthcare providers are encouraged, please do. Um, continue to report pregnancies with prospective ARV exposures to APR, especially those involving the newer ARVs. And here is the advisory committee consensus. We have an independent advisory committee who meets every six months, um, evaluates the data, and they conclude that the registry finds no apparent increases in frequency of birth defects with first trimester exposures compared to exposure starting later in pregnancy and no pattern to suggest a common cause. Um, again, strongly encouraging you all um, to continue to report the cases prospectively to the registry. And here is the information. Um, it's on the APR website also. And the authors, um, we all we acknowledge the outstanding efforts of the clinicians submitting cases to the APR, as well as the valuable contribution of the steering committee and Seniors Health, which is the coordinating um, center for the APR. And then we list the um, independent advisory committee members here. Thank you.